Shalom everyone and good evening from Ljubljana, Slovenia. I'm here. I just finished um, a great time with uh, my wife in um, Poland, in Warsaw, Poland, in which I will tell you in a few seconds all about it. And then I, she went back home and I continued to do uh, ministry here in Slovenia. The Lord has truly blessed. It was amazing. I'll tell you all about it. But let's start first with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this amazing time in which we live. We thank you, Father, that uh, you are the, the Lord of all the earth. You created heavens and earth and every person in it. And Father, you are also the Lord here in Slovenia, a nation of two million people with less than a thousand believers. And Father, we thank you, Father, that uh, you have left a remnant even here. Father, I ask that you will continue to open the eyes of the blind and continue to use your children to be ambassadors of Christ and watchmen on the walls in these days. Father, I thank you for this place. I pray blessings upon the local church here, and I pray that this um, nation will uh, come closer to you. I thank you again for the things we're about to discuss and for the truth of salvation through Christ alone that will ultimately be ringing all around. I thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, shalom everyone again. This is Amir Tsalfati and I'm here live from Ljubljana, Slovenia. This is the capital of a nation that is only 2 million people, 300 kilometers across from one place to another, it's a nation that is surrounded by Croatia in the south, Hungary on the east, Austria in the north, and Italy on the west. It is in a former part of Yugoslavia or part of former Yugoslavia. And wonderful people. Now I was shocked to hear that out of 2 million people that live here, Less than 1,000 people are born-again Christians, and there are not too many churches, and the churches here are very, very, very small. And that's why I was pretty shocked. Yesterday, when I arrived, um, I arrived Friday night, and I, I drove, uh, we drove to Maribor. Um, this is the second largest city, and I was shocked and they prepared me. We have a small church of 50, 60 people. And I, you know, I thought, I don't care. I don't care. The size of churches, in fact, it excites me to come to a small place and excite me to come to a nation that is not really uh, acquainted with the Lord personally. And, and um, you know, the ministry is uh, thankfully, I'm thankful uh, that uh, so many people are helping us because we can go to places like that to countries with small churches and we are not a burden on them so here i am coming to the church and to my surprise there were about 170 people last night uh, actually it was in in the afternoon and uh the reason why i was surprised in a nation of uh, nearly 800 believers to have 170 of which 160 were locals um, local Slovenians. Some came from Germany. There was an exchange student from China, one from Canada. Several friends came from uh, Romania and from um, and also from uh, from Vienna. But I, I mean, I was blown away by the fact that of the 150, 160 locals, um, uh, this is. Um, this is almost 20% of the local believers in a whole country. And they came to, to listen. I gave two messages and then I gave my testimony. And, and I heard amazing stories of people who were touched. And um, it, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing uh, to see uh, how humble they are, how hungry and thirsty they are. So, so yeah, last night I, I spoke uh, three hours. Uh, or maybe four, I'm not sure. And then this morning here in in in, in Slovenia, I, I taught the Sunday morning service in that Emmanuel Pentecostal church. No, it's not the Pentecostal you would think. 
it's uh, it's very much things are in order and and uh, it's um, it is Pentecostal, but it's not the ultra super charismatic where some weird things happen. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, uh, I gave the message. Uh, uh, this is the first time I teach on a brand new message that I uh, put together. It's called the, the Book of Life, and uh, it was well received. But I was shocked to find out that at the end of the message, um, when I stepped down from the you know stage and I came to say goodbye to people, I was surrounded by a group of at least twenty young people who ask me questions almost for 30 to 40 minutes and uh, it was uh, the sermon after the sermon I call it and uh, I'm telling you I wish every nation will have youth like that that is so hungry and so thirsty to learn more than they don't have any problem approaching the speaker and asking and, and, and it was it was amazing and I think every nation should pray that the youth of that nation will be so hungry and thirsty for the Word of God. So I was so blessed. In fact, um, the response to another invitation to Croatia two years ago gave birth to this one. Um, again, the churches, when they invite me, they are shocked that we say yes. At least the one in Croatia didn't expect the, the yes from me. And uh, because they always think, you know, the numbers. Can we afford flying him? Can we afford uh, putting him in a hotel, whatever? And we always tell people, guys, if the Holy Spirit leads me to go, I, we take care of everything. You don't have to worry about anything. And so I showed up in Croatia and they were so amazed and it was beautiful. And then some people from Slovenia came to the meetings in Croatia because it's a neighboring country and they invited me to their country and that's how this one was born and out of this one more will be born in other places in uh in Europe and uh, this is just amazing how God and the the, the thing that uh, came to my mind is how God told Elijah that he left um some remnant that uh, did not bow down to the Baal so Europe is atheist, Europe is godless, Europe is in dark, 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 dark place. I see that in the eyes of people. But God left a remnant and they are hungry and thirsty for the word of God. They are so excited and they need encouragement. And I am so blessed to, to be able to go there and, 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 and share and teach and encourage them. And so thank you all for your support and prayer because that enables me to do all of these things in so many parts of the world such as this one and uh, be a great encouragement for the brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, quite a few non-believers also came. And uh, I, from what I heard, they were very touched by the message and they had a lot of thinking to do. So it was, it was good. So thank you. Now, I told you that I came to Slovenia uh, just after I had a four or five days vacation vacation with my wife, Miriam, in Poland. Both me and Miriam have uh, some Polish roots. Miriam's dad was born in Italy on the way to Israel to uh, Polish parents survived the, who survived the Holocaust. My mom was uh, born on the way to Israel in Cyprus to Polish parents. In fact, my mom's dad was Russian who lived in Poland, and he married my, uh, my, my grandma, who was Polish from Warsaw. They were also going through the Warsaw Ghetto. and So we both felt like at some point we want to go to Warsaw and, and see the Warsaw Ghetto and all of that. And um, so we went there and we took a tour led by an Israeli guide that lives there. And uh, it was a very hard thing for us to see. Uh, we've been to a brand new city. You understand Warsaw was completely destroyed by the Nazis. The, 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 the Polish, at, towards the end of the war, had a rebellion in 1944, a great rebellion against the, the Nazis. And uh, the Nazis decided just to wipe out Warsaw from the map. It's, very few things survived. So very few things survived also from the ghetto that had a year and four months earlier, the ghetto uprising. It's amazing how the Nazis uh, came to one of the most thriving Jewish uh, communities in Europe to Poland and they basically took 450 
thousand Jews and cram them into a two miles by two miles area, actually a mile by a mile area. And um, um, a hundred thousand of them died just from 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 the, the weather condition and poverty and of course hunger and diseases such as typhus. typhus. But, um, but the rest of them were transported um, to the uh, death camp of Treblinka. And by the way, they were told that they're being relocated to Treblinka to start new life there. Um, they were told that they're going to be just relocated. It's a relocation, that's all. And they fabricated some postcards that the relatives are sending, that everything is great, everything is beautiful. But some people suspect that something is wrong there. Um, every day, for a, for a whole period of, uh, of nearly two years, every day, anything between 4,000 to 7,000 people were brought to a place called Umschlagplatz, the sending, the, the, uh, the dispatching place. And from that place, they were sent to their death. And it was very hard for us to hear the stories of, of how children were treated by the Nazis, how, how people were... It's amazing, we saw a street uh, that was just a regular Polish street, very high-end street, that was a, like an enclave between the two parts of the ghetto, the small ghetto and the large ghetto. And there was a wooden bridge across. The Jewish people had to live either here or here, but they're not allowed in that street. So they would go up and look at heaven and go back to hell. Co come out of hell, look at heaven and go back to hell. It was unbelievable. And, uh, and the, why is the reason why I'm, I'm saying that? Because uh, we were told that even today when you go to those tours, some Polish older women and men are coming out and they're saying there was no Holocaust, it never happened. I saw with my very eyes a, uh, a writing uh, that says Juden raus, in, in German, Jews out. And this is the something, you know, something that the Germans said uh, 80 years ago. It was amazing to see that people are still spraying that. And the reason I mention all of that right now is this. Listen, there is a growing wave of anti-Semitism in Europe like no other time before in history since the time of the Holocaust. In fact, what we have now equals to the anti-Semitism that was there before. And I want to tell you another thing. I want to tell you that uh, the anti-Semitism has become mainstream. It's no longer uh, something that people are staying away from. It's no longer something that people are, are even trying to hide. Just about three hours before the shooting in Strasbourg in France five days ago, just about a few hours earlier, the local Jewish cemetery in Strasbourg, France, was desecrated in 37, 37 tombstones were sprayed with swastikas and with Heil Hitler. This happened in Strasbourg, France, Three hours before, a Muslim shot to death four people, and, and, and amongst them, one of them was a Thai uh, tourist, and uh, while shouting, Allah Akbar. Folks, uh, the yellow vests movement now that is trying to throw Macron out, believe it or not, but the major, major anger that they have is towards the Jews. The growing difficult uh, economic situation in, in, in France and the jacking up of the taxes on fuel caused people to say enough is enough. And, uh, and they're looking at the Jewish population that is fa doing fairly better financially. And they're also looking at Macron. And Macron, I don't know if you know that, but made his fortune before he got into politics from working for the Rothschilds. And uh, also he was backed by and was somehow taken as a, uh, under the custody of several very wealthy Jewish people who are very liberal and left wing uh, in the political movement in France. So Macron was almost perceived as a puppet of Jews. That's how they viewed him. 
Then they looked at the rest of the Jewish population that is doing pretty better than, than others in the, in the suburbs of the cities. And so they're saying, you know what? It's a Jewish scam. It's a Jewish thing. And now all the anger is coming against the Jews. And it's very interesting because France of today is not France of uh, 80 years ago. 80 years ago, it was the built-in anti-Semitism related to, to uh, you know, religious uh, anger and, and many more. But this is now a combination of the old type of anti-Semitism combined with the radical Islamic anti-Semitism and you get all together and of course you've got the financial situation there that is not doing well and this is a time bomb basically. And it's very interesting because um, Theresa May in England almost almost lost her prime minister seat in a vote of non-confident in her own party and she was saved the last minute but She's in a very unstable situation right now. And Jeremy Corbyn, the, the leader of the Labour Party, is waiting around the corner. And this guy is a well-known anti-Semite. He's someone who praised terrorists, someone who laid bouquets of flowers on terrorist graves. He hates Israel. He hates the Jewish people. And if, God forbid, this guy becomes the Prime Minister of England, England is no longer the ally of Israel. You understand that? So... We are seeing a growing wave of anti-Semitism right now that is all across the United States, all across Europe, and in many other places around the world. And I was, you know, I was asking myself, is that really something that is somehow playing a role in Bible prophecy? And I was thinking, of it especially about Europe, because I, as you all know, I believe that... Uh, the Antichrist is going to rise from Western Europe. And I realized that the Antichrist um, literally um, will rise from the chaos of Europe to bring hope to the Europeans. But he's not into pleasing the Jews in Europe. He's into making sure that the, the Jews will all go to Israel. And so he will please them there by allowing them to build a temple and eventually, while they're all there, he goes into the temple and declares himself as God. Um, I, I was just thinking about uh, how, um, how Europe would, is causing all the Jewish population right now to leave. Israel is actually going to um, absorb more and more and more immigration from Europe right now. I overheard a conversation in Jerusalem just about a week and a half ago. I was with a group in Jerusalem. It was Friday night. There was American Jews sitting in one table. And there was a, a family from England, uh, from the UK. And the American Jews are just non-practicing Jews. And they said, well, this is the first time we're in a place where the Jews are the majority. And then they talked to the British family. And they said, how is everything in now, this is a look, I'm, in, I'm the only Israeli there. I'm the Jew, I'm the Israeli in Israel, and I watch two Jewish families, one in America and one in England, talking about how it is to live as Jews somewhere else. And the British Jew said, I believe that within 10 to 15 years, there will be no Jews left in England. It's, we cannot tolerate it. We cannot go on like that anymore. And the American Jews were very, very surprised. And, uh, and uh, I looked at them and I said, why are you so surprised? I mean, uh, anti-Semitism is, is, is all over America, America as well. I don't know if you know that, but there's a huge movement of neo-Nazis right now in the United States of America. So many anti-Semitic things are being done. And by the way, most of them, as of now, at least in parts such as New York City, are not done by... Trump supporters, just so you know. They're not even by white supremacists, uh, just so you know. Um, but the, 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 the thing is that I'm trying to say is that we're watching, we're watching um, an amazing, amazing rise in anti-Semitism all across the world. And it's going to play a very significant role in Bible prophecy. I believe that the Jewish people will literally have to return to Israel and it's in Israel that there will be so much stress and so much distress and so much attacks that they will eagerly wait for a Messiah. And when he will rise, 
uh, the Antichrist, uh, of course, and they will accept him. So it's going to be very, very interesting. I wanted to tell you another thing that happened uh, a couple days ago. Australia, for the last few months, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, who, whom I heard is a born-again Christian, Scott Morrison, he was contemplating on recognizing Jerusalem as capital. He actually even talked to President Trump about it. But um, honestly, uh, that's not the baby we were praying for. What he basically declared yesterday, actually, you know, they say he came to bless and he actually found himself cursing. That's what happened. Um, he basically said, we declare or we acknowledge West Jerusalem only as capital of Israel. And we believe that East Jerusalem will be the future capital of the Palestinian state. We believe in two-state solution, blah, blah, blah. Now, why I think it's so bad? Look, you don't have to convince anyone. By the way, Russia, Russia, way before America, Russia already recognized West Jerusalem as capital of Israel. The Russians, you can go online. I want you to go online and check Russia recognizes West Jerusalem as capital. They did that before America even recognized Jerusalem as capital. Russia said West Jerusalem. Why? Because it's a common, common uh, practice to, to say Jerusalem has to be divided. And uh, if you want to stay friends with both, you will say this half is yours and that half is yours. That's it. Believe it or not, but the Palestinians, that's the revolutionary thing that President Trump did. What people don't understand, there's so many people that went ahead and accused Trump for dividing Jerusalem. They don't understand one thing. The revolutionary thing about Trump's declaration was that he did not say half of Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. He basically says all of Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And if that's not enough, he also, listen to this, he closed, he shut down the American consulate in East Jerusalem to say we don't believe in two parts and two entities. One city, one sovereignty, one embassy. And if you Arabs in East Jerusalem wants to get some services from the embassy, then go to the embassy. There is no longer any consulate in East Jerusalem. America officially recognizes all of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's the revolutionary thing. And this is what we were hoping that Scott Morrison of Australia would do. But what he did, he caved in to the Muslim pressure and to the uh, warning of the Arab League and to his own security services that told him that all hell will break loose if he will say something like that. Just like they did to Trump. But Trump, the difference between Trump and the rest is he could care less. He's not afraid. He knows that there's so much deception. He knows there's so much corruption. He knows that if he believes in something, he needs to go all the way and do it. And that's why I appreciate him so much. And so the, the Australian recognition is very lame. It's very politically infected by, um, I would say, fear. And, and I did not expect that, honestly. And honestly, I would say, I, don't, I wish they didn't say anything because now they officially recognize Jerusalem need to be divided, whereas before they didn't say anything. So um, that's my, my point. Regarding Hezbollah, we just uncovered over the weekend a fourth uh, cross-border terror tunnel of the Hezbollah. They don't know what to do, folks. We are holding the map of all of their tunnels. You know, even in one hotel room where I'm staying, if there was one tunnel, I would never know where it is under. Can you imagine a vast area of hundreds of kilometers? How would you know where to start drilling? It's, we know where to drill because we, we have the plan. We have, we, if we were able to, from the heart of Tehran, to take from out of 12 or 20 different vaults, all of Iran's secret nuclear archive, it's easy for us also to get our hands on top of the Hezbollah, plan of uh, underground tunnels, and that's what we have. And they are so frustrated. They're so frustrated because so far they failed to execute their plan to arm their 
stupid, dumb rockets with GPS to make them smart and precise weapons. Um, we managed to destroy all of those uh, devices coming from Syria. All, almost all, almost all of the Israeli strikes in Syria were on Iranian shipment of precise weapon and precise uh, systems to be attached to the dumb weapons. In, in, so what happened is the Iranians decided to build a factory of weapon precision um, and, and GPS guided uh, missiles in the uh, surroundings of the airport of Beirut in, in, in Lebanon. Israel is warning the Lebanese, watch this, we just uncovered tunnels. That's an act of war. We reserve the right to react and respond and strike if needed. And we already told the Lebanese government, if you're not going to stop Hezbollah's attempt to arm themselves with, wep with precise weapon, we are going to strike. And so we, we passed that through the French and through the American ambassadors in Beirut. And uh, it's going to be interesting, you know, actually by, by making the discovery of the tunnels public, we bought ourselves two things, the right to attack Lebanon if we needed, and we also embarrassed the Hezbollah because they're now not sure, okay, who's the mole? Where is it? I mean, obviously, if they put their hand in such a secret plan, some of us are actually informers of the Israeli Mossad. That's uh, quite an amazing thing. And I also want to tell you guys, um, that in while I was in, or we were in Poland, and, and by the way, we had great time. Uh, we needed that time, and we had a great time. We really enjoyed it. Um, but while we were there, in another city in Poland, there was a, a city called Katowice. There was a, another climate change convention. They, they're just relentlessly dealing with that. And they finally, they say that they finally reached an agreement how to successfully once again revive the Paris climate change. Um, and uh, they reached some agreements, some steps. Now, let me remind you something. First of all, in the comments section right now, you're going to see a link to Steven Crowder's um, show on YouTube where he's hosting... A, um, a, a guy called Patrick Moore. He's a Canadian doctor um, who uh, was is a scientist and he was one of the founders of Greenpeace. And he's exposing the whole climate change scam. He's exposing that. And uh, he's basically saying it's all about money. It's all about budgets. It's all about inflating numbers so people will... And this is, by the way, I believe, and I've said that's for the longest time, I do believe with all of my heart that the climate change is the trick of the enemy to bring about a one world government. And why? Because it's not working any other way. You know, whenever we try to open borders and to just completely annul nationalism, then nations are actually rising up against us. So what is the only way that nationalism plays no role in? protecting planet Earth. So what we need to do is push the agenda of climate change. Tell the whole world the two things. Tell the world that temperatures are rising, the Earth is, is getting warmer, but also tell them that the increase, um, um, increasing uh, use of CO2 uh, uh, in uh, fossil fuels um, is uh, the cause of it. Now, <laughs> the same Patrick Moore said something very interesting. It's almost like saying that there is a great connection between shark bites and ice cream consumption. You're probably asking yourself, how come? Shark bites? Ice cream consumption? Well, yes. At the same time, ice cream consumption grows higher. Shark bites are actually cases are, are higher. And so you can conclude that uh, every time you eat ice cream, the sharks are coming to bite people. 
But that's a dumb conclusion because the third factor is that summertime is when people go to swim more and eat ice cream more. And that is why at the same time people eat more ice cream, there are more shark bites. That's it. So what happened is we have global warming. I don't deny that. Everybody can feel that. And we have increased use of CO2 that, uh, that you know, because of, of uh, the use of fossil uh, gas. But the connection between the two has never, ever been proven. And let me tell you another thing. The warming that we are going through right now started in the 1700s. Nobody, nobody used CO2 emission in, in, the, eight, in the 1700s. In fact, the warming got so much in the 1700s that in 1814, the Thames, the, the river in London stopped freezing. From 1814, it's no longer freezing. Now tell me, if it's in 1814 getting to a point where it's so warm that it stopped freezing, is it really because we use so much um, carbon oxide, I mean CO2 and all that? Are, are, are we crazy? I, I can tell you one thing. The making, uh, and, and uh, I can tell you another thing, okay? Now everybody says it's a consensus. Everybody believes that the use of that greenhouse gas causes the global warming. Well, consensus, until Galileo proved that Earth is not flat, the consensus was the Earth, that Earth is flat. Until um, Einstein proved the relativity, everybody were against him. In fact, you know, people were protesting against what he said until they found out that he was right. Well, you know, the fact that there is a consensus doesn't mean it's right. It means that a lot of people might be wrong. And consensus, by the way, is not a scientific word. You cannot come and tell me there is a consensus, therefore it's right. No, it's wrong. Consensus can come when the media, which I call them the medianites, is brainwashing people. So you get a consensus because everybody are sure that that's the right thing. They don't even check. Because everywhere around, people speak the same language. But I'm telling you, folks, um, go online. Um, I'm putting in the comment section Stephen Crowder's uh, YouTube interview with, uh, uh, with uh, Patrick Moore. And I want you to see from the ninth minute all the way to the 20th minute, all the way, he's speaking about that. This is just amazing. And I want you to know that. And, and the reason why I make the linkage between cl climate change and anti-Semitism on this uh, update, it's because Macron raised the taxes on gas so people will use less gasoline because he is doing that for climate change. So the people of France are saying, we're sorry, but we're not going to pay the price for your stupid plan to reduce Earth temperature in two degrees. Uh, you want to reduce earth, earth uh, uh, temperature in two degrees or, or, or at least make, it, make sure it's not going to rise in two degrees and then kill all of us from hunger? We're not going to do that. And everybody understands there's a scam. It's a lot of money. But the most important thing, and Pope Francis said, Pope Francis said himself, and you can check it online. He said this, there is a need for a global government to enforce the fight in global um, warming. That's what he said. The environmental thing is cross borders and cross countries. It becomes something so big that there is a need, he said, for a global governing body to make sure that all the countries will obey. Ladies and gentlemen, now you see the trick. The trick has nothing to do with really global warming. And by the way, Earth has gone through cycles of warming and cooling the whole history. Um, and what we see now is nothing different. By the way, if things will, it's way more dangerous that Earth will get cooler than warmer. I just want you to know. The same uh, Patrick Moore said, take a look at America and Canada. America has less land mass, but it has 10 times more people. Why? Because Canada is so cold, people can't live there and food cannot be grown there. So is Russia, by the way. 
So just so you know, global warming can actually be a good thing by being, you know, places that were not uh, uh, warm enough to, for agriculture are becoming warm enough for agriculture. I'm just telling you, folks, we as humans are species of, of, uh, of warm weather, not of cold weather. And uh, people need to understand that. Now, again, it's a scam. Again, it's a, uh, the plan of the devil. And, and again, it's part, as I said, it's part of uh, the global effort to bring about global government to rule. And uh, I'm not surprised why it's the, the Paris climate change agreement. As I said, I believe that Europe, uh, France and Germany in particular, will be the place that will dictate the changes that will be in such crisis that will give birth to a, a savior, a leader that will eventually act as the Antichrist himself. That's how I believe uh, and uh, you're going to see it uh, unfolding in that way. And so uh, I just, uh, I hope that uh, you understand this is uh, what we have today. There's a lot of things that are happening. Um, things are heating up in the West Bank because the Palestinians, I want to tell you something, that was the worst year ever in the Palestinian struggle for us to get something. Ever. The worst year ever. Not only that there is recognition of Jerusalem, not only that the embassy moved to Jerusalem, but also everything they tried to fight for failed. From all of the violence actions in Gaza or from Gaza, nothing came out of it besides $15 million that Qatar is paying them every month. They literally sent people to die and to get injured and just, and just did so much evil. For what? For $15 million a month. That's it. How tragic it is. And uh, I want to tell you something. America, just so you know, your newly uh, elected uh, congresswoman, uh, the Palestinian one, is uh, planning on showing up to Congress for the um, taking oath to office, dressed like a Palestinian and uh, swearing on a Koran and she re, she's going to remind you every day, every day, that uh, America is not anymore what America used to be. And every time you look at her, think about the great America that might not even come back to what it was. It's, it's, it's quite amazing that the Palestinian propaganda made it to United States Congress under the auspices of the Democratic Party. And uh, you're going to see way worse things than that because people are just out of their mind. They, they, they just hate each other so much that they're just voting for people without agenda uh, that has anything to do with America. It's an agenda that has a lot to do with other religions and other, uh, and other um, people. This is it, folks. Um, listen, a lot of bad stuff we talked about. But God is on the throne. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to tell you folks, here I'm in Slovenia, less than 1,000 believers in a country of 2 million people. About 800 believers. Can you imagine? And they love the Lord. You know, the, the, the girl the, and, and the, her husband that, that picked me up from the airport, she lost her parents uh, in a car accident when she was a teenager. She had to have her uh, brothers and sisters uh, growing up uh, in, in the, you know, in, with their uh, grandparents. Um, she had all the reasons in the world to hate God and hate the world and be angry with everyone. Yet she found Christ. And after she found Christ, her brother and her sisters and another sister, and then her uh, rest of her family. And now her husband became a believer, and his brother became a believer. I mean, folks, there is hope. And the hope is not in the governments of this world. And the hope is not in the, in the systems of this world. The, our hope is in our Lord. Our hope is in the one, the maker of heavens and earth. 
The message today was, is your name written in the book of life? That's what we need to make sure. We need to understand that only by faith alone and by life that reflects our faith, we can make sure that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And when we get to heaven, the Bible says the books will be open. And we want to make sure that our name is written in the right book. Because the rest of the books are books that the other people will have to deal with. What we need to make sure is that God will not read to us the other books. Because our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So, trust in the Lord. In the midst of so much chaos and so much confusion and so much hatred, you can only find true peace and true love and true hope in Jesus. So I want to encourage all of you, do not be dismayed. Do not grow weary. Do not... Listen, things are... I, unfortunately, I, I must tell you, Jesus never promised His disciples a garden of roses. He never said, now that you are believers, everything is going to be great. In fact, He said... In this world, you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer, because I, I have overcome this world. Our hope is in the victory that has already been achieved 2,000 years ago. We, we don't hope for things that might happen. We hope for things that will happen. Because He who promised is faithful. He's shown His faithfulness to everyone uh, in, 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 in the darkest times that we were and He will be your Deliverer. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you shall be saved. Repent and acknowledge your need for a Savior. And He's there to, to take care of you. That's what it's all about. And when we make it to the season of Christmas, Christmas is not about chocolates and marmalades. And Christmas is not about trees. Christmas is not about little babies dolls. Christmas is not about gifts. Christmas is not about good food. Christmas is all about Jesus coming to the world in the shape of a man and becoming the ultimate sacrifice so we will not have to uh, have to deal with the consequences of our life as non-believers. He took our sins away so we will not have to be judged. And the minute we believe in Him, we're no longer awaiting judgment. We are awaiting a marriage ceremony. We're no longer awaiting tribulation. We are awaiting rapture. We're no longer awaiting the terrible things of this world, but we are going to be in amazing mansions. So there's so much that the Lord has promised in His Word for us. These are the things, if, if indeed you were raised with Christ and set your mind and, 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 and your thoughts and, and, and on the things above uh, where Christ uh, came from, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Look, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, but we have a great praklit, a great counselor, a great defense lawyer. That's Jesus. And as long as Jesus is your Savior, He will protect you. He is the one that will always, always make sure that God sees you perfect and spotless because of His blood. So hold on to that and remember that this is our hope in this terrible world. Again, I want to thank all of you. I'm going to do probably one more uh, one more um, live before Christmas. And uh, I want to thank all of you for a wonderful year. Uh, we've, I've been to more than almost 20 countries across the world, many of them places that if it wasn't for you guys, I would never be able to go there. And lots of people got saved. Lots of people were encouraged. And, and again, it's an amazing opportunity to share the hope of the gospel in, in a very dark world. So I want to thank all of you for your prayers and for your support, because this is something that makes a great difference. I also want to tell you that our app received a new look. Uh, so you can download Behold Israel app on both Apple and Android. So go ahead and update it. 
Uh, I want to tell you folks that we have a new website, beholdisrael.org. And uh, I want to tell you that if you want to see a picture of the sermon after the sermon today, go to my Instagram, Behold Israel. One word, Behold Israel. Follow and like and go to our website, our Facebook, our Twitter, and our YouTube. Follow and subscribe. And we thank you again for everything. And now allow me to end up this update with the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. יאר אדוני פנה ולך ויחונך יסא אדוני פנה ולך ויאסם לך שלום The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you shalom give you peace He can give you the peace that surpasses all understanding it's a peace that the world cannot give nor can the world understand only the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, can give you that peace now and forever, here and everywhere. In the name of that Prince of Peace, we pray. In the name of Yeshua, our salvation, we pray. Amen. Thank you. I love you. God bless you from Ljubljana, Slovenia. Next time I'm in Israel, I'm going to preach in my own church in Haifa next Saturday. Pray for me. <laughs> If, you know, this is, I can speak in so many places around the world, thousands of thousands of people, but in the small congregation that I belong to, it's probably always the hardest. Um, so I need your prayers. Thank you. God bless you. And Shalom from Slovenia. Bye-bye.